So I've been pondering the issue of focus, mental focus, very specifically. And if you were to ask me why, uh, my guess is you might be able to hazard guesses as to why. We are going through a season of history that demands that if you are, I mean, we're here in America, right? It demands if you are a good American that you fix your gaze on the things of this earth and that you pick a side and that you know precisely where you stand in the mix and in the battle. And I'm not going to say that all of that is wrong. I'm going to say that it is a bait and it is a part truth and the enemy works in part truths. And that is for us to be responsible and to caretake well for the zone and the jurisdiction that we have is wisdom is right. If I have a jurisdiction known as my own body and my own thought life, I shouldn't forsake it by being distracted elsewhere. I should focus. If I have a marriage, I should take care of it. I should focus. If I have a family, I should take care of it. I should focus. If I have a church, I shouldn't just, you know, say, oh, I don't focus on things like that. There are things that are right for my mind to focus on. And so I live in a country. Should I not care? How about I have a vote? That's a rare thing in history. Should I not care what I do with it? So all of these things I would say are reasonable. They're reasonable for us to take our attentions and give them there. However, there's a proper way to do it and an improper way to do it. And I would suggest at the very beginning of this message that most of us do it in the incorrect fashion. Not because we want to. It's just because we were never trained in how to. And it is somewhat of a unique art form, this thing called the Christian mind and how the Christian mind works. But there's been such a little understanding within the modern uh, rendition of Christianity towards this end. And most of us, when it comes to what is going on inside of our brain, there is a lot taking place there. And it is a limited sphere. We, we can only have that much in front of us at any one point in time. And so though, therefore, though we know we should be meditating on Jesus Christ, we should be thinking about his word, we should be pondering his greatness. Well, that's impractical too, because I have all these other things and responsibilities that I need to have in the focal point of my mind, which leads us to a message like this. I believe that the chief focus of the human mind that we are designed by God to have, our chief focus is meant to be Jesus Christ. I could say it this way, Jesus Christ and him crucified. I could say it this way, the word of God, the word of God in text, person, and action. What he, who he is, what he has done for us actually is the chief focal point of our being. It's what we're designed for. Now, if you were to hear me when I say that, some of you could scoff inwardly. Of course, you, theologically, you'd be careful not to scoff outwardly. You'd be like, well, that would sound bad if I went, ha! However, inwardly, you have some problems with that potentially. Why? Because there's a lot of things in life that are being thrown at you that you were responsible for. How in the world are you supposed to pay your bills if you don't focus on paying your bills? I'm going to just focus on Jesus. My bill will sort of take care of itself. How do you drive a car down the road if you're just focused on Jesus Christ, you're meditating with your eyes closed? It's like, hey, you, it's impractical, Eric. I understand what you're saying theoretically. And it really sounds good in the poetry of scripture, but not in the practical side of the Christian life, which again leads us to this message. You see, I believe that the mind, when focused where it's supposed to be focused, is actually very powerful in addressing all the other sub-issues that it is meant to caretake for, when it tends to first things first. If you do not address first things first, then you have to rely on different systems and operations of man in this earth to be able to caretake for the other elements of life, which is what we usually do. So let's walk through this. Uh-oh, we have uh, that age-old problem of uh, the clicker not working. Could you at least uh, move me forward one? Oh, there we go. Maybe, was that me clicking too? 
Oh, that was you. Okay. So the cathedral of thought. I really like the word cathedral. Because, I mean, I'm a word guy anyways, but cathedral, isn't that one of the most beautiful, just elegant words? I really like it. And so I, I like the idea of associating what I'm talking about today with a cathedral. And so my, my basic concept that I'm going to bring up is that the human soul is a cathedral. And I mean, you could imagine a beautiful uh, cathedral. You probably have to go somewhere a little older uh, with a little more history to find really the type of cathedral I would be talking about. Go to Europe somewhere. You know, whether that's stained glass, you know, the, uh, just the elegant architecture that is just, you know, you could say breathtaking. Yeah, the human soul. It's designed like that. It's designed to be breathtaking. It's beautiful when it's, properly lit and you can see it. Its design is spectacular. So the unique architecture, I'm going to describe it as three levels of focal perspective here. So this cathedral or this inner man or this soul, this part of you where your gaze is, the, the essence of your life, your mind, your will, your emotions, this is where they are uh, actively engaged. This is where they are located. And I'm, I'm describing it as three levels of focal perspective. That's a unique way of saying it. But you could just imagine that, you know, up in the front of the cathedral, you know, where all the stained glass windows, maybe there's a cross there. Uh, and uh, maybe there's a lectern up there, right? And then you have this second tier, and then you have a third tier. So it's sort of like a three level, three tiered uh, concept. And so level three, and you're going to notice that my, my numbers are unique on this. It's very purposeful. That level three is what I'm calling priorities and purpose. Level two is necessities. And level one is desire. So, you know, all of us, when you're sort of entering into life, you sort of enter in through the door of just desire. You know, just look at a little baby. And, you know, they're going to be crying out for what they crave, what they want, what their appetite is seeking. And uh, then you're going to begin to develop this idea of needs in your life and things that are just practical. They need to be dealt with. You know, how am I going to get from here to there? I need a bike or maybe I need a car. Uh, how am I going to, you know, pay for that? You know, and you have these different focal points of life. Some people would call it Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Where you're just sort of dealing with the most basic elements of life and then you're progressing in life to more advanced things. And things like, you know, at the level three, priorities and purpose. You know, there's certain people on earth that if you were to say, you know, something like, what's your mission statement in life? They do not have the luxury of figuring something like that out. They don't have food. They're trying to survive. They're sleeping under a bridge. What is my purpose in life? That doesn't even fit into their grid. And the same can be true for many humans that are spiritually homeless, that are spiritually hungry, that they do not have, they're not being fed and they're not having their basics met in the desire and necessity side. And they are living in a level one, trying to get to level two type of function in this human cathedral. So I'm going to call it a dark cathedral or the dark cathedral, which is the human quandary. You see, this cathedral, though beautiful, though lovely, you can't see it as lovely. You have like these, just imagine sort of a haunted cathedral, probably the best way of talking about it, where you have maybe some spider webs uh, on the wall. And it's really dark, except for you have these little fires, you know, that are, that are lit around. And it's just sort of a creepy place because you have fires lit to try and light and warm areas of your life where you have desperate need. And so you can't see the overall beauty you can only see localized dimensions of your soul's need. So I'm going to call it the human quandary. How do you get this sacred oil from way up on level three all the way down to level one to satisfy my desires? Okay, now you don't know about the sacred oil yet, but I'm going to introduce you to the sacred oil. You see, up on level three, I'm calling it a drum, a drum of sacred oil. And so this drum of sacred oil I, I'm calling it a 10 gallon drum. It, you could make it bigger, smaller. It's just, I'm creating a number. It's an imaginary number just to sort of show that there is a quantity of oil, sacred oil 
that is supplied every day to the human soul. It's a supernatural thing. Just like the sun rises, sun sets every day. God gives the sun, he gives rain, whether you're righteous or unrighteous, makes no difference. He gives sacred oil to the righteous and the unrighteous. It's not because you're doing something right. It's because you're his creation and he supplies this sacred oil, but it's way up on level three and your needs are way down there in level one. It's like, I don't even have time for that, but you need the oil because that's the only way to ignite the fires. It's the only way to create the warmth. It's the only way to get a little light in your life. So the 10 gallon drum on level three, it's daily filled with 100% pure, now I'm gonna give a name to this, care. That's sort of what the Bible calls it, care. It's a weird name for it, care. Yeah, you're given care. You know that the Bible is going to be very clear on how you're supposed to spend your care. You're not supposed to care for this, 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 this. You're actually supposed to care for this. So I better fill in the blanks of what all the this, 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 and this, and this is. Care. So the Greek word is miramno. Now, if any of you were around, I mean, we're talking 14, 15 years ago, Ellerslie, I gave a a message on Miramno. And so it's sort of fun for me to come back to that. And this is sort of like revisiting ye olden days. Uh, So Miramno translated, different translations, depending on which Bible you have, worry, carefulness, anxiety, thought, like take no thought or have no Miramno. So that Miramno, just first blush, let's be honest, doesn't sound like a very positive thing. Uh, worry, anxiety, carefulness. I mean, thought doesn't sound bad, right? But in the context that it's used, it's, it's not a positive. You're not supposed to be doing it. So this would look like something that you're not supposed to have, when in actuality, it's a gift. It's just that you're supposed to spend it properly. You see, you were given something, but when you misuse it, you waste it on the wrong things because this is actually meant to brighten, to warm, to empower your cathedral. But when you splurge it in the wrong ways and you take it lightly and you mishandle your miram no, well, that's called a waste. So miram no, it's an oil. That's what I'm referring to it as that burns hot and produces a great flame. And I'm saying that it's used for energy, power, and light. Now I'm creating a metaphor at the same time I'm teaching the truth because the Bible doesn't say that Miramna is an oil. However, the way it's described and the way it's used could easily be described that way. And that's how I described it in my message 14, 15 years ago. And for me, a guy that has misspent his Miramna for whole seasons of my life, I'm very sensitive to this. When I was 28, Leslie and I were in ministry. We'd been in ministry for approximately three and a half to four years. And I had cares. I had cares of this world. I had anxiety. In fact, I had such an extreme version of anxiety that it was shutting down my physical existence to the point where I could not breathe, couldn't take in a deep breath, Uh, I remember I was walking through the Pittsburgh airport with Leslie. I couldn't even carry my suitcases in the days. I don't know. I didn't have a rolling suitcase. I'm like actually carrying a suitcase. And I had to set it down. And she's like, what's going on? I'm fine. I'm fine. And I pick it up. And I could not pick it up. And it's like my whole body was falling to pieces. I remember the, the, after getting an EKG, the guy said, "Uh, what do you do for a living? (laughs) you're showing signs of stress, like physical stress on your heart that are like the type that a 60 year old business executive would show. What do you do? I am like in uh, Christian ministry. It's like, how embarrassing is that? However, I was mishandling the care in my life. I had all sorts of problems. I had financial challenges. I had issues in the tours that we were setting up. I had, the church was just, so insensitive and so unfeeling and uncaring for those that are trying to serve it. It's like, this is hard work, this thing called ministry. 
And so I was sending all my oil to try and help and solve issues in my soul that were hazard points. I was anxious about this. 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 I'm taking my oil and instead of using it the way it was designed to be used, I'm sending it to all of these different needs in my life. And in so doing, I was wasting it and it was actually destroying me. So I'm going to go through uh, this passage in Matthew. I'm guessing all of you are very familiar with it. It's ironic how familiar we can be with a passage of scripture and yet not actually apply it. But you're going to see that it's 25 through 34 in in chapter 6. This little passage is not, you know, nine verses. But I'm going to use the same reference for all of it because the whole thing is in that passage. I'm going to give you little clips and then I'm going to make a comment, give you a little clip, make a comment, or give you a clip and then add something to the scripture to give some clarity. So Jesus talking, he says, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is that life more than food and the body more than clothing? It was just sort of a easy questioning right there. It's like, well, I mean, I can understand it intellectually what he is saying, that I'm not supposed to worry about my life. I'm not supposed to worry about what I will eat or what I will drink or about my body or what I will put on. That I can understand it intellectually. So why is it so hard to do that? Because imagine if I were to say this last week, for those of you listening to this via podcast in the future, we just had an election in America. And imagine if I said, do not worry about who wins the election, whether it is Harris or Trump Do not worry. Is not God in total control? Are not all things beneath his feet? And you can hear it intellectually, but that doesn't necessarily solve your dilemma because you're still worrying. You're still worrying. Okay, intellectually, I know I'm not supposed to worry about it because Jesus says I'm not supposed to. Why? But why am I still worrying? And I'm trying to lift this to the surface so you can see that we can know the truth But the truth needs to actually set us free. We can't just esteem the words. We actually need to follow up on that and say, okay, Lord, I'm still worrying. What needs to change in my life? So here's a amplified version with my little parenthetical added. I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now I added a little parenthesis here. Do not dump out your sacred oil and burn it errantly on what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and your body more than clothing. So I'm starting to give you an understanding of what's taking place with this drum, this 10 gallon drum, as I would say it, of sacred oil that you have been given each day and how you spend it shows either the success or the failure of your life. What are you doing with that care? And you see, you are supposed to, according to scripture, you're supposed to care about very specific things. Isn't that a weird thought to think that you're supposed to be anxious for certain things? You're supposed to worry in a strange way. I know that isn't a a healthy word for us. We have no positive context for the word worry. But you're supposed to care and invest yourself with intentionality into very specific things. And yet we don't. We actually misspend our care on things that God says, don't care about that. Don't worry about that. Don't be anxious about that. But we're like splurging in those very directions. Do not dump out and burn your miram now, your care on these things. Your life, well, that's a hard one uh, to have at the top of the list. Food, drink, health, covering. I mean, that could be everything from clothes. And of course you could say like in our culture, it would be your clothing designs. Like if I have the hip styles. It wasn't necessarily what it was referring to here. It could be everything from shelter to even having healthy clothing and clothing at all. And so that isn't where your focus is supposed to be. Yet I could imagine if you didn't have food or drink or you were dealing with serious health impediments or you were struggling with clothing altogether, how that could definitely draw a little attention from your soul and maybe a little care Maybe a little anxiety. I could imagine it being rightfully directed in those places. And Jesus comes to this earth. God Almighty, come in the flesh. And he says, don't put your mirror now there. Don't, that's not what it's meant for. Hey, I know your tendency is to put it there. I'm going to tell you, 
don't direct your sacred oil towards those things. So Matthew 6, 25 through 34, here's another subsection of that. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. So now we recognize that this is an issue of faith that where you are directing your care is showing where your faith is. And when you misdirect your faith, you're showing, you're exhibiting a little faith. It's just like, oh, you of little faith, oligopistos, teensy weensy faith. So here's the thought that goes with this. This is the logic. If God cares for the birds, the lilies, and even grass, and intimately cares for their life, food, drink, health, and covering, how much more would he care for you as his child? Now, I doubt that that logic is lost on you. It's, it's pretty easy to think that thought and to conclude that way. That doesn't necessarily free you and totally solve your problem because we all know these scriptures. I mean, you don't have to hang out long in Christianity to know these passages in Matthew 6. We know them. So why is it that we continue to persist in directing our care towards the very things that God says, don't do that. Don't direct your care towards that. And there you go. You just put your care towards that. Are you in defiance? Most of you are like, I'm not trying to be. I don't know how not to. Hmm. That's important to note. Sometimes when we don't know how not to, we need to take that to God and say, God, I don't know how not to, but I know you know how to. And so my confidence rests in your ability to disciple me, to teach me, show me what I need to do. So another subsection of Matthew 6, 25 through 34, and I have some parentheticals in here to sort of help us out. Therefore, do not worry. And in my parenthetical, I say, do not pour out and burn your sacred oil of Miranal in this way, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry or pour out and burn your sacred oil of Miranoa about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Again, we know these things. So in this last week, my guess is that some of you experienced a little care for the things of this earth. Because the consequences of how things went this last week were significant to you personally. We usually don't care about things if they don't affect us personally. Have you ever noticed that? You could hear about other problems in other states and weird behaviors, you know, in inner cities. You could hear about things in foreign lands. It doesn't really have a huge impact on you until it becomes your issue. And suddenly when it becomes your issue, care directs itself straight to that. And you begin to turn it over in your mind. You are pulling and drawing on that 10 gallon drum of care and you're splurging it and spending it in a zone of your life that God has actually gone out of his way to say, Hey, Eric, not there. Well, God, how is that supposed to be addressed then? I mean, if I don't splurge my care on that, who is, how, who's going to care for this area of my life? If I don't, well, that's a good question. Who would care for that area of your life? If you don't, who would care for your life? If you didn't make that your focus, who would care for your food and drink? If you didn't make it your focus, who would care for your health? If you didn't make it your focus, who would care for your covering? If you didn't make it your focus, I'm glad you asked. You see, God himself is going out of his way. According to the pattern of our creation, what he designed to correct something that is off. 
He's saying the Gentiles, which by the way, I think is all of us. The Gentiles are predisposed to make these their care points. This is my care point as a Gentile. I must deal with it. And if I don't, I'm an irresponsible Gentile. And God says, I'm calling you out of that life. I'm setting you free from that life to now work according to the pattern that I created you to function by. That care is no longer yours to splurge any which way you think. That care is mine. Let me have it. What does that mean? That means you no longer care for the things of this earth. What? Well, who's going to? And if God was talking, he'd say, that's my job. Your job is to dump your care on me. You dump your care on me. I care for you. That's the deal. That's the bargain. If you want to say it that way, God says, you trust me to take care of you. Your job is to dump all of your care, all of that. We could call it worry, thought, whatever it is. I'm going to give you some better words for it that actually translate a little better into our language. You make me your focus. So for that, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry or pour out and burn your sacred oil of Miranau about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The self tap. So you have a drum and there is a proper way of dispensing the oil. And it's like a little spigot down at the bottom and it's supposed to dump into this basin at the bottom. However, that's impractical. So what we do is we tap into it with what I'm calling a self tap. It's a, like a piping system. I need to get this care down to level one. And so we tap into it and we try and drain it out to our needs, to the things that we think are supposed to be God's focus, but since he's not obviously dealing with it, I need to deal with it. So something is wrong with us. We take this sacred oil and we misspend it. Why? The elaborate piping system of selfish humanity. First of all, I could answer that why question by saying something's off with us. God makes it very clear we're not as we're supposed to be. It's called sin. It's a self-interest at our core. It's not a God interest at our core. It is a self-interest at our core. And therefore, because the 10-gallon drum was designed with a spigot that's supposed to land into a basin known as Jesus Christ, God Almighty, his kingdom, his righteousness, well, that's not where I want mine to go. And so we have to pipe it where we think it should go. And that is because we are about us, our life, is in our care, our hands. We need to deal with it. So I'm going to give you a sample self-piping system for a day in the life of a classic squanderer of sacred oil. Now, this, this could have been a lot better, I have to admit. Oh, I want this. How can I get it? That's a level one need. So now you're going to create this self-piping thing down to level one. And then, same day, I feel vulnerable. People my age need to address this issue. Otherwise, bad things could happen. And that's like piping it up to two now. But what if I never get to enjoy that particular pleasure? pleasure? It's unfair that Chuck gets to enjoy this pleasure and I can't. That's down to level one again. And now, why am I even here on earth? Does any of this matter? What's the meaning of life? Well, it's, it's good that you're getting some level three contemplation. Now you need to pipe it all the way up to level three. And then I don't know why I'm here, but while I'm trying to figure it out, I must find a way to satisfy this particular craving all the way down to level one. By the way, self-piping is very inefficient. It leaks all over the place. So you get the, the oil into it, but then it just drips. So it's like you're losing 95% efficiency in, in just piping this stuff around. You're basically just wasting your life. You're wasting your precious care. Meanwhile, your own issues are actually not being solved the way God intended to. You think you're doing something great by being anxious. You ever thought, had that thought going through your head? You're working. I mean, it's really hard. Building this whole piping system is a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's soul sweat. And it actually only makes you more miserable. Anxiety, care, misspent 
is human misery. And yet we still persist to do it because we have convinced ourselves that it is a form of wisdom to exert anxiety towards my needs, towards my desires. God's going out of his way to say, doesn't work. Do you want me to show you how it works? We're like, I'm not exactly sure if I want to find out. God already gave us a solution, but we struggle to return to it because it, it just seems preposterous, to be honest. So the result, the result of our self-piping system, it's a miserable, dark, shadowy existence. Wasting the gift of care, spilling it out on everything but what it was designed to be poured out upon. So let's get down to some practicals. Removing the self-tap and establishing a kingdom tap. It totally changes a life. God already has a kingdom tap, but it's like plugged. And we need to unplug the kingdom tap. Turn on the spigot and say, my life, my care is going to be focused on Jesus Christ. The way Jesus says it is, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. And then he makes this unique statement that we all see, but we don't quite know how to respond to. And all these things, life, food, drink, health, covering, will be taken care of. Now, I'm going to speak from the human vantage point. We have a little incredulity towards that. It's like, wait a minute. So I seek you and then you deal with all these other things. How does that practically, functionally work? Have you ever had it where you leave something in God's hands? Oh my God, I'm going to trust you with that. And then it sort of falls to pieces. And that's all it takes is one of those moments where the devil's like, see, see, look what happens. And Leslie and I would travel uh, to overseas. So we, when we were first married, we were being asked to speak all over the world. And at first we were like, no, no, we, we don't have the capacity to do that. And then it felt very unspiritual to not do it. I mean, these, the world needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every single time we traveled outside the country, something would fall to pieces at home. To the point where I basically said, and I didn't even talk to God about it. It was just like, nope, we're not speaking overseas anymore because every time we do, this happens. This, this is the devil's game, is that if he can create some chaos when you put your trust in Jesus, when you radically give to Jesus, and then he's like, see if he can make some noise and other, you know, make some clattering sounds in other parts of the cathedral. See, see, if you don't make that your care, it's gonna fall to pieces. The key with truth is that you must do it and persist in it, even when the devil starts knocking over furniture and lamps. Even when he starts clattering, making sounds in the midst of your life, trying to blame it on the fact that you're making your focus Jesus. Keep making your focus Jesus. Keep making your focus Jesus. And you'll begin to see every single thing in your life will begin to be cared for the way only God can. So when we're dealing with the removing of a self-tap, there's a couple things that we need to notate. Okay, now, there's a lot of different ways that a self-tap can work. I have different vulnerabilities and different things that have self-tapped over the years. I don't know what yours are. Uh, politics is one of my classic self-taps. Now, there, there's some in here that like, can't stand politics, so it's very easy for you, and you can get all upset and disgusted with people that do struggle with that. It's like, what is their problem? That is like so disgusting. It's like just a whole bunch of people yelling at each other. I know. I mean, what's the deal? What is attractive about it? I'm not exactly sure, but my brain, the way I function, is very intrigued. Must have information. And so, that is a self-tap at, at a certain level when I, instead of focus on Christ, Christ is like, hey, could we talk? And I'm like, yes, in just a second, I just need to check on something. And after I check on something, it's interesting, but then I need to check something else. And then there's just one more thing. Oh, and by the way, I'm out of time to spend my time with God. It's a classic runaround technique where the devil wants to distract Eric Ludi with a bait. It's a self-tap. Eric, you really need to have some care going to this because, I mean, you're not going to be a responsible human if you don't. Now, that one actually has some sense, and some of you can uh, identify with it. How about this one, though? The Denver Broncos. 
The Denver Broncos aren't even that good of a team. It shouldn't matter. And guess what? I've been healed from the Denver Broncos. Once that BLM thing came into town, I was freed. And no longer did I care. This is great. I'm finally set free. And this is a lifelong self-tap challenge that I've had. And then someone tells me, I think it was my barber, says, you seen the Broncos? They're actually, you know, like doing pretty good. Really? I must know more. <laughs> Okay, so, and it's not just one time where I look. Now it's like, I think the Broncos are playing right now. I just want to glance at the score just to see if they're continuing in their operation of excellence. Uh, the Denver Nuggets. Now, some of you are just like, these are terrible teams, Eric. Now, the Denver Nuggets are not a terrible team. The Broncos, you know, that's a different story. But the Denver Nuggets, I have a brother that always wants to tell me about the Denver Nuggets. He's like, have you, have you heard the latest? Then I should say something like, no, and I don't want to. Instead, I'm like, what is the latest? I grew up a Denver Nuggets fan. And once a Denver Nuggets fan, how about this? Once a self-tapping Denver Nuggets fan, always vulnerable to being a self-tapping Denver Nuggets fan. Now, these are these could all be deemed totally ridiculous and I would understand because I think they're ridiculous too. They don't have any value in the eternal sense and they draw attention and care, even though it's not stress care. It can be though when your team is in the finals or in the Super Bowl, it's extremely stressful guys. If your team is behind it's the fourth quarter, it's a weird how it can just drain out 80% of your drum in one you know, play we can misspend very easily. When you recognize a mis-expenditure, what should you do about it? You should tag it, note it, repent. That's what you should do. Because it's not that it's evil in and of itself. There's nothing innately evil about government. There's nothing innately evil about football. There's nothing innately evil about the Denver Nuggets. It's when it is taking your focus away from where you're supposed to be. So I, I'm not even going to say that there isn't a possible place for all of these things. However, I don't want to go there. I want to start with the core. I want to say where our focus is supposed to be dedicated first. And that is what needs to be solved in our life because there's two things that needs to happen. A deauthorization and an authorization. A deauthorization is a spiritual action of the soul to deauthorize spiritually what you have given place to. I know it sounds weird that a distraction or a focal distraction could be a spiritual operation in your life. However, this is how the enemy works. And I do not know what your self-tap vulnerabilities are, the things that will gather in your attentions and suck the care out of your life. But you need to first notate them. Then you need to spiritually unplug that. In the authority of Christ, I renounce this activity in my life, this focal point in my life. It is a deauthorization of something that has been absorbing your focus. And then authorize a God focus. Lord, I freshly commit to using the tap that you gave me, which dumps into the basin known as Jesus Christ. The, the tap on the 10-gallon drum of care. So I'm going to call this seek. Isn't that a funny name for it? Seek. Where are you seeking? You see, where a seek is like a, it's a tap. And we, if we seek the wrong things in this world, are giving and splurging our care every which way. God is very clear in scripture what we're supposed to do with our seek. So, We'll read through Matthew 6, 25 through 34 with our seek. For after all these things, life, food, drink, health, and covering, the Gentiles seek. They tap the 10-gallon drum and burn their sacred oil incorrectly in order to gain. For he your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek. Set up a God tap on the 10-gallon drum and dump out the oil on first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added to you. 
Therefore, do not worry or pour out and burn your sacred oil of Maranoa about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The Jesus Basin. So here's the way I've described it in my own soul. You have this third level, which is the priority point of why you're here on this earth. It's your purpose. And yet so many of us are dealing with these lower level desires and necessities that we fail to realize that we are here for a purpose. God wants to elevate our game into that third level. And he wants to show us the care, the 10 gallon drum. He says, this gets filled every day. You could change your life right now just by changing this. You need to Remove the self-taps. You need to clarify what this inner life is all about. It is no longer about the things of this earth. It's about the things of heaven. And I know, I know the propensity is to say, but what about the things of this earth? God knows about the things of this earth. He's not ignorant. He was a man too. He did live in this skin. He understands the dynamics that we face in the human side. He's the perfect guy to trust with this because he is acquainted with our way as humans in this earth. So when we take and we open up that spigot, the God spigot, the kingdom tap, and let it all go into the basin known as Jesus Christ, and I mean every day. Every day, our entire life is about Jesus. Now I know, some of you are like, this is so impractical. It's perfectly designed to catch every drop of probably should say preciousness. This is what your life is about. It's about Jesus. And you could immediately say, I I do have other things in my life. I, I need to, I need to brush my teeth. And to do that, I need to have a toothbrush. And I also need to have toothpaste, but to buy that toothbrush and toothpaste, I need some form of income. And I might even need to drive to the store to get it. I could bike, I could walk, but you know, it depends on where I'm at. I have needs, I need cover, I need a shelter. I mean, what's the good? I wouldn't even have an ability to do that if I don't even have a house, if I don't have a place to live. All of these things the Gentiles seek. This is the mind of a Gentile. They are fixed on the things of this earth and what they need in life, what they want in life, what they crave in life. This is not what you are called to. You are called to empty your care into the basin known as Jesus. I'm going to call it the glowing cathedral. When the seek gets corrected, the entire inner man comes, there must be something going on in my keynote, comes to life. It literally shines. So you know all those stained glass windows that you've never seen? You see, you light this basin, you dump this into the basin, it fills up your sanctuary. And suddenly it's glowing. Now there's another piece to this that is really cool. And that is that as this basin, as this, gal- this 10 gallon drum is dumping into that basin, there's like a runnel system that it overflows into and begins to go into every corner of your life where it is needed. Wherever you have a need, God will direct that care to it. But he will do it. Your job is to focus on him. And as you focus on him, he will give you wisdom and show you what to address in your life. He will light the path. So all you need to do is follow the runnels and say, okay, Lord, what's the wisdom for this? All these things shall be added. Life, food, drink, health, and covering. So how does that work? If I dump my oil on Jesus, how does that address all these other things? So I'm calling it the ancient runnel system built into the cathedral. A runnel is like a little path in which like water or something like oil can traverse. It is designed to distribute oil and light precisely in the soul where it is needed. So I I picture this oil being ignited so that when it lands in the basin, it's like a flame. It's just my mental picture for it. I mean, I don't know what, if you can come up with a better one, right? And then it's going to be distributed according to God's wisdom in our life, precisely where it needs to be. And the whole while it's lit. So it's bringing light, bringing warmth 
to the very areas where it is required in our soul. Precisely the right amount of care is directed, but it is directed from the Jesus basin, not from my self-tapping system, which is wasting 90 to 95% of the oil on the way there. This is getting 100% maximization of the human life by allowing God to direct his care in his way. And that is the secret to the Christian living. So I'm just going to read through a few scriptures that are, you're going to notice seek. I'm making them bold. I'm underlining it so that you can see it. And those who know your name will put their trust in you for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 14, two, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. Remember that I'm calling it the seek is, is the God tap. You can have a self tap, but those that seek God are actually opening that, that God tap and dumping it into a God focus. Psalm 24, six, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, say law. Psalm 27, eight, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. Isn't that interesting to think of that Jesus basin being the face of God? You are seeking the face of God. Psalm 34, 10, the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Isn't that interesting how that parallels with Matthew 6? The young lions lack and suffer hunger but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Psalm 105, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. Blessed are those, this is Psalm 119 too. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. It's like another way of saying it is who seek him with the entire 10 gallon drum of care. Proverbs 28, 5, evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand all. You want to have the mind of Christ? Seek the Lord. Dump it in the Jesus basin, you'll have light to see. You'll understand what the purpose of this inner man is and what you were designed for. You were not designed to be stressing about the things of this earth in your little lower level zone with your little campfire down there after wasting 90 to 95% of your care on the way there. You were called to focus on Jesus and let him in and through you focus elsewhere in your life and in others' lives the way he deems fit. You are meant to be operated by God, not by you. You are meant to allow his care to lead, not yours. You know that he actually is commissioning us to care for others? Yeah. We're supposed to care for his glory. Did you know that we're supposed to spend Miram now on his glory? We're supposed to spend Miram now on the lost and the least of these around us? No, we're supposed to care. We're not supposed to not care. We're just supposed to care God's way. We're not supposed to be self-absorbed. We're supposed to be God-absorbed. And when we are, then our care is able to be leveraged where it's supposed to go. It's very difficult to deal with the poor around us when we're dealing with our own issues. God wants to set us free from focusing on us so that we can focus where he is requiring us to focus. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Intentional focus. So inside of your life, you need to stop being a victim. I don't really have any control about what I focus on. I don't really have any control about all this anxiety and all these things that I'm dealing with. Well, I guarantee you that isn't the spirit of God talking to you. As if the spirit of God is like, yeah, I don't know what to do with this character. They're a total mess. You see, God does know what to do with you, but he's commissioning your soul to rise up and respond to truth, to believe the truth, to take the lead in your soul. And he says, okay, let's go to this 10 gallon drum way up on the third level. God, I'm still dealing with things on the first level. Come with me. We're going to deal with the things that really matter. You see that self-tap? Yeah. I want you to remove it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Then how am I going to deal with this? By dumping it all into this basin. At first, that sounds counterintuitive. That somehow my needs on level one are going to be taken care of when I dump out all of my Miram Nal into a basin on level three. 
but do we trust our God? I know you have needs, says God. I know you have needs in your life. I know you have needs for food. I know you have needs for health. And I know you have needs for covering clothing and housing. I know that. But I know how to best care for those things. And that is, I need you to make me your focus. So in regards to your focus, I want you to lead in your focus instead of allowing your thought life to lead you. You must direct your thoughts towards things above. You must aggressively take the helm of your thoughts and say, no, yes, no, yes. You have to be aggressive in this territory of your life and not passive. Second Corinthians 10, four through six talks about this very thing. It talks about the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that is, exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Listen to this, bringing every thought captive into every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's the equivalent of saying, getting every self tap out and making sure that every thought is in obedience into that Jesus basin. You direct it there, everything changes in the rest of your cathedral. Your cathedral is well lit. You can see clearly to address every issue in your life and the issues in other people's lives. You're no longer in the dark cathedral. Philippians 4.8. Now it's interesting because I don't know if any of you have ever just tried to do this. And it's like, finally, brethren, Paul speaking, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We know that, but that isn't necessarily what we meditate on. You see, the secret is the basin. You make Jesus your focus, that is the basin. It's truth. It's nobility. It's just. Uh, justice, it's purity, it's loveliness, it's everything that is of good report. If there is any virtue, it's there in the basin. If there's anything praiseworthy, it's there in the basin. God says, this is your focus. It's Jesus Christ, the great manifestation of God in the flesh. You see the Father when you see Jesus. You see the Almighty when you see Jesus. Focus on Jesus, and what will happen is your meditations will now be instructed according to his nature. So therefore, when you are dealing with something like a country on the brink of destruction, you actually can think about God being in control of said country. You can realize that when things go dark, that God's church awakens and is strengthened. You can ponder it from a different vantage point because you're pondering it from a third level instead of a first level. You are pondering it through the lens of Jesus Christ and his triumph on the cross instead of your weakness, your human frailty, and your vulnerability. Where your oil goes, so goes your perspective. So goes your attitude. Think on this. Jesus. Seek this, Jesus. And your cathedral will light up with joy, peace, wonder, and awe. And every single need of life will be personally tended to and cared for by your amazing creator. This isn't my pattern. This is God's pattern. The guy talking to you struggles with the same pattern and the implementation of the same pattern as do all of you. In other words, this is a constant thing to rehearse and to remember in my life. And when I start to find my mind wandering and my processing distracted, I have to deliberately take the lead over my thought life again and take that captive and take that seek and pour it into the basin. Lord, I seek your face right now. I could seek information. I could seek news. I could seek some kind of positive feedback from someone. You ever had it where you just want to hear something positive? Could someone tell me something positive? Boy, have I had that at different points in my life. I'm sick and tired of bad news. Someone give me something positive. Did you know that Jesus' entire message is called good news? It's like, you want to hear some good news? Yeah, I already know that. 
You should hear it again because it's still good. In other words, this basin is the focus of our life. This is where God wants us to direct our focus. Father, I ask that you would work this miracle in us. Lord, we are prone to wander in our thoughts. We are prone to take our precious care and misdirect it. But I pray that today you would do a beautiful, gentle work of correcting us as the body of Christ and drawing us back to you. We ask for this grace in the name of Jesus. Amen.